Godot Tutorials is not sponsored by or affiliated with Godot Game Engine. In this episode, we will be taking a look at the following. The truth of coding, refactoring, code smells, or at least a basic introduction into code smells, the extract and insert class refactoring technique, and live coding of refactoring the Pong game. Also, don't forget that the code will be uploaded to GitHub, so if you don't actually want to watch the video, please feel free to download the source code at GitHub under Pong07, and that scene will hold all the code for this episode. Anyway, moving on. Now, let's take a look at the truth of coding. And this is true regardless of game programming or software development. And that is, coding is a process. As a matter of fact, in my personal opinion, I would separate the process into 70% of the time you will be thinking, structuring, and editing the code base. And 30% of the time you will be coding the features. And as a matter of fact, writing good code is not an act of genius. Being a good coder is having a way of thinking, structuring, and editing code that makes it easier for you and others to see what the code is doing. Refactoring is restructuring existing code without changing its behavior. Changing behavior would be adding new features. Now keep in mind that your code is a living, breathing, and ever-changing aspect of your project. You may find yourself applying multiple refactoring sessions over the course of your project, especially as more features and ideas come to light. Now, why exactly should you refactor your code? And refactoring your code allows people to quickly learn, understand, and debug your current code base. In this regard, new people that come onto projects don't know what the code base is doing, and so Readable code allows them to learn and understand the project. On top of that, existing people on projects may forget about feature implementation. And so when they want to add a new feature that's based off of an already existing feature in your project, refactored code, which is just readable code, allows them to quickly learn and understand certain parts of the project so they can go ahead and quickly implement new features. Refactoring code is an art form, and it comes with practice. And with any type of refactoring, there are no simple rules. There are just general guidelines. As a matter of fact, there are no right answers. And over time, you will get a better sense of what needs to be done. And I would say that this is hard to show in a tutorial, but I will try my best. On top of that, rules and general guidelines can be broken. Since general guidelines can be broken, refactoring, in my personal opinion, is that refactoring code is 100% subjective. Each individual programmer has their own standards, their own beliefs, and how and when you should refactor. And again, refactoring is best learned through practice. So the more you code and the more you refactor, the better you get at it. One way to start off with identifying when to refactor is to look at coding smells. Now, what exactly is a code smell? Well, a code smell is an abstract indicator or characteristic that shines a light on a deeper problem in your current project. Basically, they are signs that code or certain parts of code in your project can be refactored to look cleaner. And again, when identifying code smells, these are 100% subjective. Regardless, some common code smells you may run into your journey are the following large classes, which is what we have as the main issue currently in our Pong project. You may also find duplicated code. You may find issues with comments, meaning that there are too many comments or there are a lack of comments. You may run into long methods. And lastly, you may run into conditional complexity, which are just large conditional blocks in your code, such as nested statements. This could be if statements, case switch statements, and while loops. Now again, these are all subjective because, for example, what constitutes a large class? And there are no hard rules for that. Another example of code smells being subjective is how much is too much when it comes to duplicated code. On top of that, how many comments do you need? Another subjective question is what is considered a long method? And you can start seeing here why code smells are subjective. But regardless, let's look at the large class. So why are large classes a problem? And 
Basically, large classes are difficult to understand and debug. On top of that, what makes a class a large class? And in my personal opinion, a large class is a class that does too many things. As a matter of fact, a class should be doing just one thing if it is able to. And one smell of a large class is if a class contains functions and or variables that do not relate to the purpose of the class it is currently residing in. The solution to that is to do the class extraction refactoring technique. The extracting class technique is basically taking a class that is too big to understand and splitting it into multiple classes. And this can be two or more classes. Now, some signs that your class needs to be broken apart is when multiple parts of your code seem to fit together better. On top of that, when a class has more than one responsibility it is doing. And on a personal note, a class that has more than 400 lines of code. However, that is not a hard rule. That is just a personal rule. And that also depends on what the class is doing. So how exactly do we go about doing a class extraction? Well, first, we need to decide how to split the responsibilities. We need to group methods and class variables and see if they synergize. On top of that, we need to look at the original big class and see if there are more things that need to be refactored out into either an existing class or a newly created class. If you can refactor something out, you can also refactor something inside. And so in this case, we can do the class insertion or the class inlining technique. And that is basically taking two or more classes and combining them. And signs of when to consider class insertion is if multiple classes have similar responsibilities and or if multiple classes only rely on each other and are not used by other classes. Now, with everything that we learned so far, this is what I'm thinking for the current Pong game. The most important thing for me at this moment is to make the game state as clean and readable as possible. As a matter of fact, when I come back to it, whether that be a month from now or a year from now, I would like to have a sense of what is going on in each individual case statement, which is our game state. And as a matter of fact, maybe a year from now, I would like to add other things to the game. For example, adding power ups to the game or limiting the movement of the player paddle. So after thinking about it, my game plan is to create classes for collision, the ball, on top of that, creating a class for the paddle in which I would also create subclasses for the player paddle and the enemy paddle. And on top of that, I'm thinking of a class to hold a box container that limits both the player paddle and the enemy paddle to a certain portion of the screen. But in this case, for now, we're just going to have the box container just hold the values of our screen. Now, to make the game state readable, Whatever logic is left inside of our game state, I want to extract those out into their own functions. And that's basically it for the structuring phase. So after thinking and structuring, now let's go ahead and actually edit our current Pong game. So in this case, let's start with the low hanging fruit. And the low hanging fruit would be renaming our scene to properly describe what we aim to do when creating our project or when you press the play button and renaming our main GD file that runs our game. So in this case, we can right click, head over to rename, a pop up should appear and let's just go ahead and name this Pong game. And in this case, this properly describes what our scene will do, which is to run our Pong game. Next will be the Pong GD file. And so if we look at our code as it currently stands, You'll notice that our Pong GD file is mainly used to run our game state and to change it based on what the player presses and when inside the play case, or in this case, game state.play, actually run the Pong game where the player is playing against the AI. And so in this case, we can head over to Pong.gd and we can rename it game state. Once that's done, let's go ahead and create some folders to organize our game. And in this case, we can right click on the main folder or root folder, head down to new folder. And in this case, since we know we want something for the ball, we can name a class ball. We can do the same thing for other things we need as well. In this case, I also think we need one for pedal. 
Third, I believe we need something for everything else, so we can call it miscellaneous. And for me, that's good enough. And again, there's no right answers when trying to organize your file system structure or when it comes to refactoring. Regardless, again, just think about what you need to do, structure it in the way you think is the best solution to the current problem. And lastly, just go on and edit the thing. In this case, I think it's best to name each individual folder based on what I think we'll need. In this case, a paddle, which will have a base class subclass, a ball folder for our base class ball, and maybe in the future subclasses and miscellaneous for other things that I'm not sure about just yet. Regardless, let's move on to actually refactoring. And so in this case, I'm going to head to miscellaneous. We're going to go ahead, find new script. In this case, we can get rid of the node. I'll go ahead, click here, and we'll just find the resource. Pick template to be empty. And lastly, I'm going to pick the path name, and I'm going to name it collisions. Lastly, I'm going to head to path, and I'm going to name it collisions. Press create, select collisions, and let's go ahead and start editing. Now, in this case, we're working on collisions because it is the next lowest hanging fruit in our refactoring phase, in my personal opinion. And really, we only use one collision detection, which is the rectangle to point collision. However, in this case, we can add our point to point collision just because I used that as an example in the last episode. And so in this case, we can actually use the static function and we can call it point to point. And in this case, it takes in two arguments. And in this case, we can create two parameters. And they return a Boolean. We can just say point A dot X is equivalent to point B dot X and point A dot Y is equivalent to point B dot Y. And that's basically a point to point collision. And basically both points need to have the same X values and the same Y values. And that's basically a point to point collision. Now, what we really need to create is actually a point to rectangle. And that takes in a point value, which is just a vector two. And more importantly, it takes in a rectangle value, which is a rect two. And in this case, we just want to return back a Boolean because they are either colliding or not colliding. The rectangle has a position and a size. And if we were to just straight out write a return, it's going to be a really long line. And so in this case, let's create some variables every time we call this static function. And that's basically it for naming our variables. So again, rectangle left is rectangles position on X axis. Rectangle right is X axis plus size on X axis. Rectangle top is just position on Y axis. And rectangle bottom is the position plus the rectangle's size on the Y axis. In this case, we just need to make sure that our point on the X and Y axis is basically inside our rectangle. And so that is really simple to check. In this case, use the return statement. And we shall say rectangle on the left has to be less than or equal to our point on that X axis. And our point on the X axis has to be less than or equal to the rectangle on the right. And in this case, we can do the same thing for our Y position. So in this case, rectangle top is less than or equal to our point on the Y axis and our point on the Y axis has to be less than or equal to our rectangle bottom. And that's basically it for our static function point to rectangle collision check. One more thing we need to do is add a class name. So in this case, class name, will be collisions. And in my personal opinion, a class name should be the same as the file name, just makes things a little easier. They don't have to be. So because we are using the static keyword, that means that we don't have to create a class instantiation of collisions every time we need to use the methods. We can just immediately and directly call the point to rectangle method. And so let's go ahead and do that. In our game state, we can go ahead and replace out everything that looks like a point to rectangle detection. In this case, I'm just going to delete all this code here. It's going to throw some errors, but regardless, this right here, these two if statements is basically our point 
to rectangle collision. As you can see here, we are testing against the x-axis with the paddle and the y-axis of our ball with the paddle. Now, in this case, what we're going to do is actually call the collisions function directly. So collisions dot point to rectangle takes in a vector and then it takes in a rectangle. So in this case, we can just say ball position. So in this case, we have a ball position here, which is our vector two, but we need a rect two value, except we don't have anything of that sort right now. And so we need to create this ourselves. We need to pass it in the player position and then the paddle size. And that will give us our rectangle that we can check against the ball position. And we will refactor this out later. But for now, we are just trying to make sure that we're removing unnecessary code to make it a little cleaner. So in this case, rectangle two, player position. And then in this case, paddle size. And that should satisfy our if statement. In this case, now that we have that, we can delete everything else. And right now this error is just because of the paddle divide. But we do have our point to point collision. And in this case, we're just going to borrow from here the var tempo speed to change our speed value. And that should remove the error. Now, now in this case, I don't like what we have here. Even though we fixed the error, I want to actually change this. And so what we're going to do is to add randomness to the collision just for testing purposes. We won't keep this forever. But what we can say is, in this case, since ball speed is a vector two, we can actually create a vector two. We can replace that with ball speed for the X position to reverse the direction. And on the Y, we can actually do something like rand range. And we can say any value between negative 400 and positive 400. And so as you can see here, we've created a collision detection between our ball and our player pedal. Now, as you can see here, we replace basically 10 lines of code with two lines of code that does the exact same thing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to copy and paste this, remove and we will replace that with two lines of code again. We can keep everything the same. All we have to do is change this into the AI position, keep everything the same, and it should work. Basically, every time we have a ball that collides with a player pedal, we change direction for the x-axis, which is reflected back, give it a random range on the y, so which we will change later on. And we do the same thing if we collide with the AI pedal. And as a matter of fact, we need to test this out. And so if we were to run this, you can see that the collision works. However, because everything's random, we do not have control over the ball. But at least we know that nothing really changed internally. And when we refactor this out again, we can replace it back with whatever we need it to do to give the player a chance to beat the AI based on skill and not luck. Regardless, this is perfect because now we know we need to change the ball. So let's go ahead and actually create a ball class. So from here, we can go back to our editor. So in this case, to create the ball class, right click on the ball folder, click new script. In this case, we do need a node 2D. We can choose template to be empty. We can give the name of our ball class just ball, ball.gd. We can go ahead, create it, double click on the ball.gd file. Let's go ahead and give it the class name ball. Now we need to go back to our game state gd script file, and we need to basically find all the code that would belong to a ball class. And so we can see here we have ball variables. On top of that, we do have a ball speed. We also have a player speed, but I think that's just for the paddle. And really, the ball speed activates in the play state. You can see that our ball position changes here. And more than likely, we also need to reset everything to the center. And so you can see here that in the player is serve or is not serving, we do change the ball speed. And in the set starting position, you can see here that we do reset the ball. So by looking through the code and trying to figure out what the ball is doing throughout the code, we can figure out for ourselves what we need for our ball class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to organize everything together. Take all the variables that belong to the ball class and actually group them together. 
Go ahead, copy paste those variables into the bulk class so we get a better idea of what we need. I'm going to comment them out with command K. You can also right click and toggle comments. And this will be my template for creating the ball class. Now I see a few things. I see a radius, a color, a starting ball position, ball position, a starting speed, a ball speed. Basically the starting speed resets our ball speed into what looks like a straight line. And on top of that, there is one more thing here. If I remember correctly, we do have a variable for is player serving that determines what direction our ball is moving when it starts. And so maybe we can also have a function that resets the ball speed based on a Boolean that's passed into it. And so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just create a something for like player serve. And so now I'm going to go ahead and actually create the class. In this case, I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to start it off with the underscore. And that's to let me know that I would like this to be a private variable that can only be changed inside of the ball class. In this case, it's going to have a radius, which is a float value. On top of that, I do see a color, which is going to be a color value. Excuse me. On top of that, I would like the color to be a white color every time it's created. Next, I'm going to create a variable called reset position, shorthand position with POS. In this case, our position is a vector to value. And we have the reset position to change our position value, which our ball will be drawn against. I can do the same thing for the speed. And lastly, I would like something for the player serve value. And so in this case, I'll create variable player serve, which will be a Boolean value. However, I'm going to write a comment to let me know that I don't think I need this. But again, I'm not sure. And so you can see here that refactoring code is basically a personal and subjective matter. I think I need it, but as we continue factoring things out, everything will be clearer. Now, in this case, we do need to create an initialization function because when we create this to the scene, I want to do this in the game state. And in this case, our player has to give us a radius. In this case, I'm going to call it rad float, color, color, a start position, which will be a vector two. We're also going to give it a, in this case, I do want a speed, which will be a vector two. And then lastly, I want a player serve, which will be a Boolean. I'm going to create the pass to throw out the error. And in this case, I do think we should set a default speed. In this case, I do want to organize the code where everything declared is on the top. And in this case, I'm going to say that our vector speed. In this case, I'm going to give it 400 and zero on the Y axis. And so our speed will start basically moving to the right in a straight line. Now, on top of that, I'm seeing a few things. They're becoming a little clearer now. I feel like we can also set a default radius. And in this case, the default radius will be 10. And so all we really need for the player to actually start is give us the starting position. And on top of that, the player serve. And so in my mind, I feel like the player can choose the color. But in this case, I don't want the player to choose the color. And so I'm going to take everything out. I'm also going to turn this into a default true. And basically, I'm going to keep everything as is. And so basically, we do have our default, we have a position value that needs to be determined by the player. And lastly, the player can choose what direction the ball starts in. But regardless, if the player passes in nothing, it's just going to be true. If you want the player, or in this case, if you want the programmer to have the control of determining the color, speed and radius when a ball is instantiated, you are able to. But for now, we're going to keep it like this. And in this case, all we're going to say is that our position will equal the start position. On top of that, we do have a reset position value, which will just equal our starting position. In this case, we have to be careful. And so I'm going to write a comment. And that's to remind myself that our reset position is the starting position, assuming that the ball starting position is the center of the screen for our pong game. And lastly, player serve will equal the player serve being passed in if anything's being passed in. But by default, this should be true. 
Regardless, we can move on to other things. In this case, we can create a function draw. We would like the ball class to worry about drawing itself. That takes in a position, a radius, and a color. And so now every time the ball class calls its draw function, it will draw itself. On top of that, we do need something for moving the ball. In this case, we plan on having a delta being passed to us. And all we do is we have the position plus equal, in this case, our internal speed value times delta. And we call the update method, which calls our draw function, which just draws to the screen. In this case, we do have other things we need to worry about. For example, we do need the ability to reset our ball. And in this case, it takes in a Boolean value, which represents the player serving because we need to change the direction our ball goes in. It doesn't do anything except resets our position value. So in this case, position is equal to reset position. Now that we're working on the reset the ball, we need to do two things. We need to reset position and reset speed. And right now, all we're doing is resetting the position. However, I noticed here, and reset speed does not equal to speed. And so in this case, let's go ahead. Reset speed is just equal to speed. My thoughts are that we have reset speed inside the initialization function because one day we may want the game state to actually control what the speed of the ball should be. But right now, because we're not giving that control, Outside of the class, we're just going to call that our reset speed will basically equal to this value here, our vector 400.0 on the x-axis, a straight line to the right. Now that we've created this, we can actually come here and reset the speed. And so in this case, what we will say is our speed value will equal to, and we will use something called the ternary operation, but it's just an if statement in a single line. And in this case, it will equal reset speed if player serve is true else and in this case negative reset speed in this case if the player is serving our speed will be in the positive direction so moving to the right else that means it's the ai serve and so if the ai is serving the ball is moving to the left now once we've resetted the position and speed we can go ahead and actually call our update method which draws our ball to the screen in what we assume to be the center. Now, on top of that, I'm thinking of a few things. I'm thinking of the fact that our ball needs to move itself. And so when it collides with the top or bottom of the screen, we need to inverse the speed on the y-axis. And we also need to invert the x-axis when the paddles hit the ball. So in this case, in this case, we're going to call a function called inverse y speed. And what we can do is our speed on the y-axis will just equal the inverse of that speed on that y-axis. And that's it for inversing the y-speed. In this case, we can do the same thing for inversing on the x position as well. And it's basically just going to be the same thing we had in the game state. And as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and find that line of code where we change the ball speed. Here we go. And it's just vector two. Inverse the speed on the x-axis and pick a random range. And we can do exactly that. In this case, it's just going to be speed on the x random range. And lastly, if we go back to our game state, we do see a few things. For example, we do need the ball position. And what we can say is function get position. It will return back a vector two. And in this case, we just return our position value. Godot allows you to access the variables directly. I personally don't like accessing variables directly, but no matter which one you choose, whether you have a function that gets back your variable or access the variable directly, that's a choice on personal preference. Now that we have the ball class ready, we can come back to our game state class. In this case, find every variable that has to do with the ball class. We can just go ahead and delete that. In this case, errors are going to throw. That's OK. In this case, I'm just going to call object instancing. We will create our class, which will be variable ball, which is a ball class. And it will equal to ball.new. 
And keep in mind that when we instance our class, we need a starting position, which is half screen width, half screen height. And so in this case, vector two, we can just leave it as is because the second argument will be true. And we would like the ball to start moving to the right the first playthrough. Now, what we need to do is actually add this ball class onto the scene tree. And so in this case, what we will do is call it add child. And all we need is the node. And so in this case, it's just ball and it adds itself to the screen. Now, in this case, after we added the ball class, we need to find all the errors and replace the line of code with the function inside the ball class that has that logic. So in this case, we pass it is player serve. And we can do the same thing here. Next, we have ball position plus equals ball speed times delta. In this case, what we're doing is changing the ball speed. We're basically moving the ball. And so in this case, we do have move ball. It takes in a delta and all we have to do is pass it in the delta. We do have if ball position dot X, what we can do instead is ball dot get position dot X. We can copy and paste that for this error as well, because it gets the ball position. We can do the same thing here. Ball position dot Y minus ball radius is less than or equal to zero. And so in this case, what's going to happen is our point will be on the center and not the top or bottom. What we can do is ball dot get position dot X, leave it, or because as we start refactoring, we can see things, we can also do something such as function get top point, return back a float value. And so all we're gonna do is return the Y position. So in this case, return position dot Y, and we're gonna subtract by the radius. And that will give us the top position for our point. And we can do the same thing for get bottom point. So bottom point is position on the Y axis plus our radius. And so I'm gonna go ahead, copy paste this, head back here. And in this case, we could leave it as get position dot Y. I had the X position, so I changed it to Y. So we could either have ball dot get position dot Y, or we can just ball dot get top point because we're comparing the ball's top point with zero, which is top of the screen. And we can do the same thing down here, which is ball dot get bottom point greater than screen height. Now that we have ball here, we can, in fact, just copy paste get position and replace ball position with ball dot get position. Do the same thing here in our collision as well. And that's basically it. We're just copy and pasting. So ball dot get position Y, ball dot get position Y, find our errors in this case, ball speed. And so ball dot inverse Y speed. And we're doing the same thing down here as well. And we just keep doing this until all the errors go away. So ball dot inverse X speed, do the same thing here, inversing the X speed. And because we have the draw circle, we can in fact get rid of this. And for set position, we can call ball dot reset ball. And in this case, we do need to pass it in is player serve. And that's basically it. I do think we do have is player serve here, which makes no sense because we have that up here. And so we can, in this case, I am a little afraid of deleting. So what we can do is comment them out. So now that we've commented these out, let's go ahead and see if anything breaks. And yes, something broke and it's nil. And that's probably because of the on ready value. And if we run that again, everything should work. Hopefully. Perfect. Nothing has broken so far. And that was a great example. Refactoring will never be perfect. It's just an iteration. It's a process of iteration. However, I did notice something here. I do see that we have these screen values. And so it's time that we actually refactor these out into a class called bounding box, because I wanted to increase or decrease the area that the paddle can move. And so in this case, this would be a perfect candidate for bounding box. So let's go ahead and do that. In this case, in miscellaneous, I'm going to go ahead, create a new class press new script. In this case, it's just going to be a resource. It will be empty and it will be called bounding box. In this case, I decided that the best name is bound box. So we'll go ahead, create our bound box. It extends a resource. So in this case, our bounding box just needs a few things. It's basically 
going to be exactly like our screen values. In this case, we need to know what the top point of our bounding box is, bottom point, left and right. And so it's basically just a glorified rectangle too, except in the future, we may want it to do things. And so we, or in this case, I chose to refactor this out into its own class called bound box. So in this case, we give it a name and I'm gonna create some variables. And that's basically it. In this case, when we create our class, we do want to initialize and we do want to actually pass it in a rec two and it does nothing. However, what it does is we can pass values inside of our class to manage it. And right bound is X. So again, left bound is just position X. Right is just left plus size on X. Top is just position on the Y and bottom is top plus size on the Y. And that's basically it for initialization. Now, in this case, we need our bounding box to return values based on whether or not an object is beyond the bounds of our box. In this case, our bounding box or our bound box is just the screen value as we start. In this case, all we're really doing is function and is pass left bound. And we take in a position value, which is just a vector two. And all it does is it returns back a Boolean and we can just say return position or position.x and make sure that we are greater than or equal to the left bound. And that's basically it. So in our rectangle, if we were to draw a rectangle, for example, if this highlighted was our rectangle and our X position is beyond the rectangle, then is past left bound is true. And we also want one for right bound. And as you can see here, this is basically what we're doing for the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen. And we can do the same thing for top and bottom as well. And that's basically it. Now, if we pass the left side of our box, return true. If we pass the right side of our box, return true. If we're past top, return true. And if we are past bottom, return true. In this case, if we ever want to get back our rectangle two, we probably need that. So function get box, or better yet, get rect, because we're turning box. And on top of that, I'm also thinking that we do need something to actually get our class instance. So maybe we can say, get bound box and return self. And so now we have the ability to get our rectangle and get our class, which gives us all the class features of our current bound box. And we can do other things as well. We can get position, get, as a matter of fact, because we are grabbing from the screen, we may need certain things like half height, or in this case, half width, half height, the full screen width and height. And so in this case, we, start seeing a few things. So for example, we may want to get the size, which is just a vector two, and we just return the box dot size. We can do the same thing for position as well. But more importantly, we do want the ability to grab the width and height. And so in this case, we can get half height. And in this case, we're just returning our box dot size on the Y axis and divide that by 2.0. We can also do the same thing for the get half width. And that's a semicolon. We need a colon and there we go. We got half height, half width. And because we are creating a box for the screen, we may want something called get center. And in this case, it just returns back a vector two and it's just returning our box in the size and we just divide it by two. And that's basically it. And so we got all these functions that allow us to do certain things. In this case, I do not know if I'm going to need all these functions, but for now in my head, as I'm thinking and structuring, I believe I may need some of these. Now, in this case, if we come back to game state, we can delete everything here. And instead what we can do is call on ready variable screen, which is just a rect two, and it will equal get tree. And then we need to get the root because we still need that root viewport and we can get visible rect or visible rectangle. Now we are getting an error here because 
half screen width and height do not exist. Um, a lot of the code that relies on that does not exist at this point. And so what we can do is actually create that bound box. So in this case, screen box, which will equal our bound box. And that will just equal bound box dot new. And we pass it in the screen. And as you can see here, that's exactly what we're passing in a rectangle to. Our screen is in fact a rectangle too. And now what we can do is delete this because we are basically just getting the center of the screen here. And what I'm going to do is delete that and write screen box dot center or get center. And that will clear the error. Now our ball will position itself in the center based on the fact that our screen box, which grabs its value from the screen, the root viewports visible screen, pass it in to initialize our screen box. And now our screen box comes with certain functions. For example, if we come to player position, paddle padding on the X axis and half screen height minus half paddle height, what we can do is replace this with the screen box, half screen height, and we can just say get half screen height or get half height. And if we come here to bound box, that's exactly what we do. Get half height, which is dot Y divided by 2.0 float value. We can do the same thing here. Screen width is just the size. So screen box dot get size on the X axis minus whatever we need to get plus half screen height, which is just screen box dot get half height minus half paddle height. And so you can see we're starting to refactor everything out. We can do the same thing here or in this case, half width, copy and paste this because we're going to need that for other things as well. Now, if we move further down, we're actually starting to see exactly why we're going to need the bounding box. Now, this is interesting. We have an if statement up here. The error is actually down here, but we're going to refactor all four if statements because in this case, we're checking if the ball is on the left side or if the ball is touching the right side. And we have the perfect method for that screen box dot is pass, and in this case, zero is the left bound. And all we have to do is just get the position, or in this case, ball dot get position, and we let the screen box worry whether or not our ball position is in fact touching the left side of the screen. And we can do the same thing here for the right side. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for our get top and get bottom point. As you can see here, we use the screen box class to calculate whether or not our ball has touched the top or bottom of our screen. Next, let's find all the errors in our code and replace them with this screen box class. We can just keep doing things here. So copy paste that and just look for all the errors. Make sure that we are getting the screen heights whenever we call them. We also have screen width. And that's all we're doing. We're just replacing the code that we think we need. And there we go, everything works. Let's make sure that all the bounding is working and it is. In this case, the top may not be properly registering the point. I don't think we're getting the point top or the point bottom. So if we wanted to look into that, we'd actually come here to the if statement. So all bound dot get position. We're passing get position in the top and bottom bound. And we created the point system. However, in this case, our ball can also get and in this case, if I just go to ball real quick, we can get top point, bottom point. And so it won't actually show the ball going past the screen top and bottom. And so in this case, what we can do is a vector two. So once we call vector two, what we can do is on the X axis, we don't really care what the value is. And instead we'll call the ball dot get top point. We can do the same thing for the bottom as well. And so that's one way to do it. However, I don't feel comfortable with this. I'd prefer if we just return back a vector. And so in this case, let me see if we're using top or bottom points in our code. And no, as a matter of fact, we're only using it here. And so I'm just going to come back to the get top point, get bottom point, And I'm going to change this to a vector two. 
we're going to return back a vector two value. And in this case, we're just going to do a two step process. We're just going to return back a vector two. And in this case, our position dot x for the x axis and position dot y minus radius for the y axis. We can do the same thing here for the bottom point, making sure that we add the radius instead. And so now we can actually get rid of this vector. And everything looks good so far. Now, just a quick point. We're not randomizing the seed value of the random range. And so if you notice here, we're always going on this value. And so if I were to quit, run again, run the game, have the ball, you're going to see it's the same thing. So don't worry about that. We're going to refactor some things out and then we will worry about finishing touches for the player paddle collision. Now, in this case, we have the bound box collision, the ball and everything seems to be good. However, in this case, what I want to do is I want to create a paddle class. And so if we come here, we can click new script. We can call this paddle. In this case, it inherits from node 2D. We can keep it empty. We'll go ahead, create it. We'll give this the class name paddle. And then we're going to go to game state and we're going to group everything together here for the pedal. And we'll notice that we have some pedal variables. We'll just go ahead, copy paste those. We have a player pedal and AI pedal, and I want those to be subclasses. So we will not worry about them. Now, the reason why I want to create subclasses for the, or the player pedal and AI pedal is because we do have custom settings. So in this case, we do want the player to be on the left AI to be on the right. And so in that case, the paddle class should not worry about positioning. It should only worry about a few things that they all share in common, that all paddles share in common, which is the size, the speed that the paddle can move up and down, the color, the padding, and of course, the range in which the paddle can move. So in this case, if we come here, I'm going to go ahead, copy, paste, and we basically have everything we need. We have our color. We have our size. In this case, we have our padding. And what I want to do is in this case, our variable, which returns back a paddle height, we can just create a function, get height, which returns back a float value. And in this case, we, or in this case, one moment, I see that I misspelled this here, size. So in this case, get height will just be our size on the Y. And we divide that by 2.0. Make sure we return that and add the arrow key here. And that should be it. Now we do have a few things that all paddles do share in common. And that would be the drawing, perhaps even getting the color, getting the size, getting the rectangle, and of course, resetting the position. And so I'm thinking we need to add extra variables. And so what I'm going to do is fix that. So variable padding and everything looks good so far. And of course, on top of that, we can just add some things like color, make sure that we declare what they are. Float color vector two. add some more things. I'm thinking maybe a speed. And so in this case, I'm going to start using underscore to represent private variables. And in this case, what we want is a speed and we can say vector two. Because our paddle can only move up and down, we only need to worry about the Y axis. So in this case, let's say that the paddle can move 400. Write a comment to remind ourselves only moves in Y axis. And in this case, the error stone, because we used underscore now. Of course, we need a reset speed value. And we'll just make sure that this equals to the speed. And that's only if we're going to add power ups to the ball. I don't. I don't see myself doing that in this series, but it's just there just in case, because that's what I'm thinking right now. We can always delete code towards the end. If we have a finalized version of our game in which we know we're not going to add anything to it. Now, in this case, I'm also going to add a variable. In this case, variable half height. In this case, get half height is just returning back half height. So now we have a better description for our function for getting the half height. 
Now on top of that, we do need our paddles to draw themselves. So in this case, function draw, which is just a void. We're gonna draw our rectangle. And in this case, we just need the rectangle value plus the color. We don't have an actual rectangle here. And so we'll go ahead and actually create that variable. On top of that, I do see ourselves using some other values. So a uh, position and a reset position because we have a position value. And on top of that, a bound box, which is just a bound box. Make sure that we space that out. And there we go. That's all we really need for our pedal. Now, in this case, we don't assign anything to the rectangle vector because all of this has to be handled by the subclass. And so I'll just put that here, handled by subclass. Now on top of that, our pedal should have a method to actually move the position of our pedal. In this case, it doesn't do anything, but regardless, we're only moving up or down. And so in this case, what we will do is clamp our position value based on the bounding box or the bound box. And so from game state, if we come to clamp, if you see here, if input dot is key press key W, we move up and same thing here. If key press is down, we move down. Now moving up or moving down will be handled by the subclasses, but the update position is going to be the same. And so let me show you when we move our player position, we make sure that our player position is clamped. And then we make sure that our rectangle has been updated. And then in the draw method, we actually draw that rectangle. And so we're really doing three things. One is we don't care whether we are moving up or down. We only care that we are clamping between values between our screen box. Then we care about updating the rectangle because it's the rectangle we need when we actually draw to the screen and also a paddle color. And so in this case, I can just go ahead and copy this for reference. I'm just going to put it up here. Let the errors throw, but regardless, position.y is going to clamp itself to our current position on the y axis. Now this zero here is the top of the screen. However, we're not guaranteed that we're given the top of the screen. And so in this case, we can say bound box on top of that. What we can do is do the same thing. Bound box dot get size on the Y position again and minus it by our current size on the Y axis. And that's it for the clamp. We can do the same thing for the player rectangle. We can say that our rectangle is just equal to a new rectangle value of, in this case, our position and our size. And then lastly, we can just update, call the update to draw to the screen. And that's basically it. So we have update position. However, update position doesn't do anything because we need to have some functions that allow us to move up. And in this case, we can write void or move down. And that's basically it. So we have a function to move up and move down, but this needs to be overridden by the subclass. However, it's not mandatory that subclasses override classes, but in this case, what we will do is we'll assert false and force it to update. So in this case, our game will never run, or if the player moves up or moves down, we will actually call assert, we'll call false. And then what's going to happen is we're going to write here, and we can do the same thing for down here as well. And we can say move down. And that's basically it for now. And then lastly, I do see a need to reset our position. So in this case, reset, which will just be a void.
and that should be it. Now, in this case, the reason why we're using a cert move up, move down is we're letting ourselves in the future know that we plan on creating subclasses and it's the subclasses that need to be created. And those subclasses should handle their own moving up and moving down. For example, a player paddle will move up and down based on whether they press WS. AI will move up and down based on whether the ball is above or below the center of the paddle. In the game state, we're just going to call the move up, move down, as the game state should worry about whether an input has been pressed. For example, if input is key W, player move up and player move down. But we can also refactor that in so that way the player paddle will handle movement based on key presses as well. So either way is OK. However, in this case, the assert won't call unless we actually call the method. And so depending on whether we let the game state call the method or as a matter of fact, if the player paddle calls itself, I am not sure at this point. I'm just creating classes and their variables and methods I think I may need when I refactor code out. And now we need to move on. So let's go ahead and actually create the player paddle. And again, no 2D. We'll create it, set it. We'll give it a name, player paddle. As a matter of fact, our paddle needs a class name. OK, we have. And in this case, what we're doing is we're extending from paddle. So very important, the parent class needs to be paddle. However, in this case, what we can do is actually go straight into the initialization. And all we need is just a bound box. And everything is set. And of course, what we do is we get the bound box and we assign it our box value. Now, because we're dealing with the Pong class, what we can do is check for movement. And so I'm thinking that we let the player paddle actually deal with movement. In this case, delta float. And we can say if input that is key pressed. And in this case, we want our key W. We can move up. However, in this case, move up, we'll move up, move down, we'll move down. But when we actually add something to it, we do in fact need to pass in a delta. So let me add that here real quick. And so function move up delta, move down delta. And now we can actually pass it in the delta. And we can do the same thing, copy and paste that, because if the key press is S, then we can just move down. And lastly, we do need to update, or in this case, update position. And so I'll copy that here as well. We move up, we move down. However, we need to override or we throw an error. And in this case, that's exactly what we're going to do. And all we really care when we move up is that position.y will plus equal the speed on the y position multiplied by delta. And that's basically it. We can also do the same thing for move down. And instead of the negative speed value, we can do positive speed value. There is another way to do this as well. We don't need to inverse the speed value. What we could do is actually keep the speed value and the delta, and instead, because moving up approaches zero or a negative, we can just say position.y minus equals our speed on the y axis multiplied by delta. And for move down, the y axis increases to positive infinity as we move down. So position on the y axis plus equals speed.y. Either way is fine. But in this case, we do have our player pedal. And so let's go back to the game state and actually refactor everything out. For now, we're going to keep the paddle variables. I will not delete those because the AI paddle relies on them. In this case, we can actually delete the player paddle. Everything's going to throw errors. That's OK. What we're going to do is come to the top. We're going to say on ready var player paddle. And again, our player paddle needs a box. And that's basically it. Now we need to actually add that to the scene. And so if we head over to our add, or in this case, our function ready, we can go ahead and add the child for the player paddle. And that should be it. Now 
we need to actually clear the errors. So in this case, player position, ball.get position, rectangle two player position, paddle size. And so you can see here, we do in fact need the rectangle of our player paddle. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna need the same thing for AI position as well. And so you can see here, this is a great chance to add that to our paddle class. And so in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add that function here. So in this case, function get rectangle, which returns back a rectangle too. And that's basically it. So in this case, save, go back to game state, see the rectangle here. And in this case, player paddle dot get rect, add the colons to get rid of that error and voila. Now what we can do is we can in fact delete everything here. And instead what I'm going to do is I'm gonna add that to the very top of the game state play. And just going to double check real quick that yes, we do in fact pass the delta and the delta is passed to move up or move down. And we can delete our rectangle and in set starting position, we can get rid of player position, player rectangle. And towards the bottom, we'll say player pedal dot reset. And maybe we can actually change the name to reset position. So in this case, reset position. And in the game state, we can add that here. And that should be it. And we're gonna check for errors by running the game. And look at that, our pedal now moves a little faster. The ball is actually hitting the edges of our screen. I cannot go past up and I cannot go past down. And we do have that padding here. And that's great. That's actually perfect. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is because player paddle and AI paddle are basically very similar, I'm going to duplicate. And in this case, we'll call it AI paddle. We're going to go to AI paddle. We're going to give it the name AI Paddle. It does everything the same except the position. And I'll say specific to subclass to remind myself that only the position value is different based on the subclass. And for now, I'm going to let this happen inside the AI Paddle class, but we can always refactor that out to the point where we can set this value by passing it in as an argument in the initialization function. Regardless, in this case, our position on the vector two is actually going to be a little different. I'm gonna delete everything here and remember that we're on the right side. And that should throw out the error specific to a subclass. It's also good to have that in our player paddle as well to remind myself that position is based on whatever we add in the class. And that's basically it. Now for the check movement, we have to do something a little differently. First, not only do we need the delta value, but we also need the ball value, or in this case, the ball position, which we can just call ball position, which is a vector two. And we can say if ball, position y is less than or equal to our current position dot y. And of course we would like everything centered. So half height, we will say move up. Now in this case, if our ball position is higher or is less than the center of our paddle, then we move up. Else, if our ball position on that same y axis is greater than or equal to our position on the y axis, plus half height, then what we do is we move down and we pass in that delta value. And in this case, that's what we get at the colon there, forgot the colon, but regardless, in this case, if the ball is higher than the middle of our paddle, we move up. Else if the ball is lower than the middle of the paddle, we move down. However, our AI has something a little special in that we do need a buffer. So in this case, I'm gonna call it a chase buffer and what it really is, is a float value. I'm gonna set it here and we're gonna call it 15. In this case, I'm gonna add parentheses. So in this case, what we're saying is if our ball position is not only higher than the center of the paddle, but is past the buffer zone, then we move up. And we can also do the same thing here as well. In this case, we add the chase buffer. And what we say is if the ball position is lower than the center of the paddle plus the chasing buffer, we move down. 
and we can keep this the same. Now, if we go to the game state, we can actually take everything outside of the AI paddle and we can refactor everything out. So in this case, we're going to delete everything for the AI paddle. We're going to do the same thing. Take that AI paddle and we need to add that to the scene. And now we can go ahead and actually get everything we need. In this case, we can say AI paddle dot get wrecked. And we can delete this line of code right here. Delete our AI position changes right here as well. Come back to the top. And over here, we can see in this case, AI paddle dot check movement, pass in the delta. And I'm going to refactor this out into here as well. And it takes in the ball position. And that's basically it. Our paddle checks for movement, our AI paddle checks to move, and then our ball moves. In this case, we delete our draw rectangle, make sure that all the errors disappear, set starting position, AI position. We can delete that. We can actually delete this. We can AI paddle dot reset position. And in this case, we can delete this. And there we go. All we have to do is update our position. And there we go. Set our starting positions. We move our paddles here in the place state. We have this input for key space for debugging purposes. We will delete this when the game is ready to release on the itch.io website. We have left, right bound, top bound, bottom bound for collision detection. We also have collision detection here. Everything's inside of one line, so I could just get rid of that parentheses here. And that's basically it. As a matter of fact, we only keep this update method here for our string values, which we will refactor out next. But let's run the game and see if everything works. And there we go. Now, the paddle does jitter, and that's because our ball is, in fact, or in this case, our AI paddle is, in fact, moving at a pace faster than the ball itself. And so in this case, if you want to fix that, just make the AI speed slower. Now, lastly, we're hitting home run, and all we need to do is find a way to refactor out the fonts. And so as a matter of fact, what we're going to do is under miscellaneous, we're going to go ahead and create a new script called text, and it will be a node 2D. We will create that, head over to text, give it the class name text, and Go back to game state and check everything that has to do with the text. But before that, let's go ahead and just delete all the variables for the. So once we deleted the paddle, we can go ahead and actually delete the speed. We don't need the speed anymore. And that looks a little cleaner. We do have some things. We have a string position. We have fonts. We also have player score text. You can see some similarities here. Let me show you real quick. So in this case, we have our font variable, which is just the top portion of our Screen. In this case, string value, start a game by pressing spacebar. It has a position for that. We also have half width font, height font. And you can see that that is here as well. We have a player text half width, player score position. You can see that with the AI as well, AI text half width, AI score position. And so there's a lot of similarities that our three text values have, the player score, AI score, and the instructions. And so what we can do is I'm going to copy everything here, head over to text, paste it. And in this case, we do have a font value. So what we'll say is underscore font, which is a dynamic font. And we'll say that dynamic font is new. And we need this because this will hold our text file and our text font. On top of that, we do have a value for the string. So in this case, we'll just call it value. We do have a half width, which is just a float value. We do have our height, which is just another float value. We can delete this line of code right there. And on top of that, we may need positions. I'm not sure just yet. We have a position and we do have a starting position. Now, in this case, the start position value is determined by whoever calls the class object. In this case, this is where our string centers to. 
And so maybe a better name is called center position. So in this case, center position is determined by whoever creates the text class. For example, the center position should be the center of the screen. And then the position value will change because we need to calculate the width of our font divided by two, and we need to calculate the height of our font. And so our position value will be updated based on the height of our string and the center of our string on the x-axis, and that will be our position value. And our position value will basically be determined by where we would like to center our position onto the screen. Now, the font size and Roboto file, that's gonna have to be determined by whoever's creating the text class as well. And so in this case, we can say function initialization, and we have a value string. And let me underscore these real quick. I noticed I didn't underscore them. So function initialize value string. And in this case, we have a position, which is a vector two. And let's give the option of choosing the size for our string. But if none is given, we'll default it to 24. And on top of that, let's give the option of actually choosing the text file, but if none is given, we will just load our Roboto light. And in this case, we are returning back a void. That should throw off the error and we can just continue setting everything else up. Lastly, we do need to get the center position. So in this case, center position will equal to our position in which we wish to center our text at. And make sure I spell center right. And there we go. So in this case, we do want to allow drawing. And so to draw a string, it's just draw a string. In this case, we do need three things. We need the font, we need the position, and we need the value in which we wish to draw onto the screen. Next, we do need to actually set the position, update our string to set the position onto the screen. And so what we can do is, as a matter of fact, we can have a function called update string, update string, and I'm thinking we have a new value, string, we can call this new value, and our value will equal to the new value. Now on top of that, we do need to set the half width. So in this case, what we need to do is get the position, pass it in a vector two value, and we need to calculate where our original center position is on the X axis. We need to minus it by the half width. And then we have to do the same thing for the position on the y-axis, but instead of minusing, we're gonna just add the height. Now, fun fact, we need to do that here as well in the initialization method. And then lastly, what we can do is call update. And that's basically it. So now when we create a string, we can change the values, update its position. When we initialize a value, we can update its position. We can choose an initial starting position which our string will always center around no matter how long or little the text is. To test this out, we need to actually go to the game state. We can, in fact, delete the entire draw method. We do not need that anymore. Because of that, we can delete the update method as well. So in this case, let's go ahead and create that text. So in this case, on ready variable, So in this case, I'm gonna press and we're gonna add start a game by pressing the space bar. That's the first value. The next value is actually a vector two. And we do know that it is a screen box and we need to get the size of the X axis, divide that by two and then 0.0, .0 for the height. And so what we're saying is we would like to be at the top, centered at the top, no padding for the top. And there we go, we have our instruction text. Now in this case, we can do the same thing for the 
AI score and player score as well. So in this case, I'm going to say player score text. And we have several things we need to worry about here. So I'm going to just delete this right now, just to show what I'm talking about. Move this down here. It's better explained here with the max score and this player win. But regardless, we have this player score. We have an AI score. This is all very important to the game. And our value is just our player score as a string. So in this case, we can just say player score as string. And that's our first argument. And the second argument, we have to position this on the left side. So in this case, screen box dot get size on the x axis. We need to divide that by two. And then we need to divide that by two again, which is just 4.0. And on the y axis, we need to go a little down. And so in this case, we can say 50.0. However, we also need this on the AI score as well. So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to put somewhere here for scoring. And in this case, we're going to call it score height padding. And we're going to equal that to 50. So now we have a score height padding that we can add here. And so we're 25% to the left of our screen at a score height padding. And we can do the same thing for the AI text as well. We just have to rename something. So AI score text, in this case, AI score. We still have 25%, but we need to go all the way to the left. So in this case, screen box dot get size on that X axis minus, in this case, our 25%, and then the score pattern. And so we can just add those comments here, 25% from the left and then 25% from the right. And so I think that's good enough. Now we just need to delete some things. In this case, we can delete everything here. As you can see here, this is where the 50 comes from. Delete everything, clean that up. And now we can just start adding our text. So in this case, instruction text. And then from there, we just need to fix the errors. We can just say, we can do the same thing here as well. And then we just find all the errors and actually update them. And we can see that we have this function called update string. And this looks like for the instruction text. So we can delete that out, go back to our string values. And in this case, instruction text. And we can do the same thing for where we see change string. We can delete these comments. I don't believe we need them anymore. And that's basically it. And there we go, everything seems to be working. And now what we need to do is refactor some things out. So in this case, I don't want this running all the time during our game state. It only needs to run once. And that's when we actually press the space bar. So I can add that here. And as you can see, the more you refactor, the easier your code becomes to read. And so what started off as 300 lines of code has now become 138. Now, we can even make it more readable and add code where they actually belong. So in this case, if the player win is true, update string else, that doesn't have to belong in the menu state. That could, in fact, happen when the game is over. And so we just look for when the game is over, and that would be inside here, our game serve state. And so what we say is if max score is equivalent to player score, do this, else do that. And then we can actually take the instruction text update string player wins if the player score reaches the max score, which means the player wins. 
add that here. We can add this here to the bottom. Then we can delete this if else statement, and that should be good enough. However, we could actually refactor this out into its own function. And so we can copy paste this into a function called check winner. And it will do nothing. And in this case, what we can do is use a case statement or a match statement. So in this case, match max score. And then we can test against the player or the AI. And so in this case, match max score, player score. We can do the same thing here as well. And there we go. We can add that here, check winner. And now we check winner. And if there is no winner, we actually set the starting position. We don't need this update anymore because drawing is handled by each individual class and not the game state class. In this case, we do have a set starting position and we can actually refactor this out here. Come to the code. We can in fact add our code here. This is in fact what we want. So in this case, if we add the code here, our code runs. However, it will keep running and we don't really want that. Not a big deal, but let's put these, but let's put the line of code of changing the instruction in what I think may be the proper place. And so in this case, instruction.txt update string player serve. If the player is serving, it means the player has lost. And so is player serve is equal to true, then player is in fact serving. Else, if player is not serving, if is player serve is equal to false, then the AI is serving because the player won the point and it is the one who lost that gets to serve. And now we can just delete this if statement here. Now, in this case, the lines of code are the same here. Now, in this case, we have we have something unique, and that is that we have one line or a block of code that's duplicated and another block of code that's duplicated. And all that really matters is this is player serve equal true and is player serve equal false because this is the same, right? Changing the game state to serve, resetting our delta key press to make sure that there is a delay in which the player is allowed to press the space bar. And then based on true or based on false, we either increase the player score or the AI score and adjust accordingly. And so we could actually refactor this out into its own function. In this case, we can call this function game point and we'll say player win, which is a Boolean and it doesn't do anything. And so in this case, we can bring everything back out in here. In this case, I'm gonna add game point player and it will be true or false. So game point player true, game point player false. And in this case, player win will go to his player serve, which should be self-explanatory. However, because if the player did win, then the player is not serving. And so we can just do the opposite. So if the player wins, the player does not serve. If the player loses, the player serves. So if player win is false, then player serve is true. If player win is true, then player serve is false. And from there, what we can do is player score plus equals one. If player win else is zero. And then we can do the same thing for AI score as well. So AI score plus equals one if not player win else zero. And so in this case, we add a score only if the player wins and we only add a score to the AI if the player lost. On top of that, we have an AI score text update string, but we can do the same thing for the player score as well. So player score dot text dot update string. And we only run that once in the game point. And lastly, based on whether or not our player did win or lose, we update the text. 
for player serve or AI serve. And so in this case, we can delete this here and we can say if if is player serve else, and then we can say AI serve. And there we go. We have this game point player, which changes the game state. We actually set the player serve value that we can pass into the ball to change direction. We change the score based on who won. We update our score regardless of who won or lost. And then based on who won or lost, we update our serve. However, truth is I actually don't like this here. So I'm going to exit this out into the set starting position. And welcome to refactoring where we doubt ourselves most of the time of what's right or what's wrong based on how the code starts becoming more readable. Now, lastly, we do have an issue here. As I added everything back to set starting position, I realized that the serve check winner set starting position gets a little off. And so it doesn't matter if the winner has been decided or not. Set starting position overrides our string and so does check winner. And so check winner has to be last. Now, lastly, what we can do is actually refactor out this giant if statement. And the weird thing is we don't actually need to update the score here. And so we can actually delete that. We don't need to update the score in the menu because that will be updated during the game point. So right here, game point, update string, update. And so that's there. And it's also created when we initialize our player score and AI score. AI score is string, so we don't have to worry about that there. And so now that we have this, we also have one more thing here. We have this play, and that's not good for game design. So instead, what we're going to say is w equals move up. And in this case, s is equal to move down. And lastly, going back to the if statement, we have this everywhere. So we can actually extract that out into its own function. Now, in this case, we can refactor out again. And so in this case, we're going to say function uh, check change state. And in this case, it's a new state, which will just be an integer value, which is just our enum. And it does nothing, so it becomes void. And we can say if input that is key press and delta key press greater than max time, then we change the game state based on the new state. So new state, reset our delta key. We can extract this out into its very own function, which we can call as spacebar delay, which just returns back a Boolean. And we can just press return, take this function, add it here in the if statement, and remove that. And if spacebar delay happens, then we can go ahead and actually change our items. In this case, Current game state equal new state, delta key press reset, spacebar delay. We may need a spacebar delay for other things besides changing game state. You don't have to. Now we can take this check change state. In this case, we head to the menu. We can actually check for the change state. So check for change state. And we'll say game state serve. We can delete everything here. We can do the same thing for here as well for the serve state. And we're going to replace this here for play. In this case, we have the instruction text update here for some reason. I do not know why. That should be in the play state. So refactoring helps out. In this case, we do want to exit out for debugging purposes. So we can just hit serve up here, delete this here. Add these instruction text towards the top. And we can actually refactor these two if statements out. So in this case, we can just say check collisions. And we can actually oops, check collisions. And if, if, we can go ahead, delete that. So check collisions here, and then we can just pass everything there. And so slightly cleaner our play state. 
Now, as I extract it out, I do see game point player. And we can actually finally edit this out. And then we can check. And then we can say, if it's past the left bound, it's false. And then else, if it's past the right bound, true. And so now we have a check collision, which actually checks the game point player if we're left or right. And then top bottom, we inverse ball. And if there's a collision between the ball and paddles, then we can just inverse X. And so that gives us a clean, in this case, physics process method in which I can see what every, what's happening. And over here, we can see that we have this game state that's clean and I can see what is happening. And so in this case, our menu, we're just checking for a change of state. Our serve, we set a start, we check a winner, we check for a change of state. And if you don't know what the check change state is, you actually move to that. In this case, check change state is a new state. And if spacebar delay is true, then we actually just change the game state. Regardless, we have a gameplay state. We can actually refactor this down more if you want to. For example, we, we do have movements. And so you could actually refactor that out into Pass in the delta float and pass in the delta here. And that should be fine. That should be it. Nothing should break. Move up, move down. Our AI is moving. Pedal, everything seems to be working. And there we go. We have a really clean game state. And so in this case, we have a menu. We just check to see if we change. We have a serve, start position, check winner, change state. And when we play, we actually update our instruction and we check change states. That's for debugging purposes. Then we move objects, we check collisions. Maybe put that at the bottom. And there we go. And that's basically it. That's basically it for refactoring. You can refactor more or less. And most importantly, we still got a test. So in this case, Start a game by pressing the space bar, player serve. And there we go, AI wins, press space bar. Notice we didn't actually update when we came here. And so you can see that we're catching glitches. So in this case, set starting position is where we need to reset everything. And so we can actually just copy paste this here. Set starting position, so AI score text, update, update. Make sure that when we lose, we actually reset everything to zero. So check winner, zero, 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 zero. False, true. And that's the purpose of debugging. That's why we need to test often because sometimes we're not perfect. We don't catch everything. And so in this case, AI has one, three, and now player serve is zero because they won. And we have to do the same thing to test to make sure that the player, and we actually have to test that when the player wins, the AI goes first and the score still resets. And so from here, we can actually go to the move object and in AI pedal, we can comment that out. So in this case, player wins, we're three. When we press spacebar, AI serves, and there we go. Uncomment that out. And there we go. As you can see, thanks to this, we are able to read a little better the game state because that was the goal of this refactoring session was to make sure that we could in fact read what was going on with our game state. And then from there actually move on to see what was happening if we needed to learn. So move objects, set starting position, check change state along with spacebar delay. We have a game point, check the winner and check for collisions. Now, if we look here, we can actually see something a little off. And that is this collisions here. Now that everything's a little more readable, we can understand our code more. And so I want to give you a certain scenario. Let's say that the ball is moving up and it hits the, in this case, top bound of the wall. Well, what the code is going to do is it's going to inverse the speed and so the ball's going down. But what happens if as our ball is moving down, this if statement becomes true because our ball is still 
past the top bound, but it's still moving down. Well, what's going to happen is, and I don't think I've gotten this error just yet, uh, luckily, but there should be a point where the ball can, in fact, get stuck to the rectangle or the top and bottom of the screen. And so far, we're a little lucky in that this issue hasn't happened. But there may be a case where when doing float value calculations where the ball, even though it's moving down, is still past the top bound. And so our ball moves up. And so it moves down, up, down, up, down, up. And so to show you what this looks like, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add this code here, ball.inverse y speed, to show you what this looks like. And so you see how our ball just moves up and down? Sometimes when we hit the ball, it might glitch and do that movement up here or inside our rectangle moving left and right like this. So it could get stuck in our rectangle. Well, to solve this, luckily we've created classes. And so this is a great reason why we create classes because when we run into problems, debugging becomes so much easier. And so in this case, not only do we want to check for collisions, we want to make sure that our ball is moving in a direction. So in this case, we can go here and we can say function is moving left and it returns a Boolean. And we just return, in this case, the speed on the x-axis and speed is a vector. Now we can do the same thing by moving right. And so in this case, we need to make sure that if speed is greater than or equal to zero, we are moving right. And we can do the same thing for moving up and down as well. So in this case, moving up, speed y is less than or equal to zero, we're moving up. And if we're moving down, and so in this case, if our speed y is greater than or equal to zero, then we are moving down. Now, so far we've been lucky that our code has been running correctly. However, we need to add these extra checks just in case. And so in this case, screen box that is past top bound ball dot get top point. And as long as our ball dot is moving up, then we inverse that way. Even if our ball is still past the top bound, which means even though our ball is still past the top of the screen, because our ball is no longer moving up, we will never call this if statement, therefore having that issue with the ball moving up and down really fast. And we can do the same thing here as well. And we can say, and ball dot is moving down. And so when we touch the bottom of our screen, so when we touch the bottom of our screen, and as long as our ball is moving downwards, we're going to inverse the speed. And then we will never call this if statement again, even if our ball is still past the bottom portion of the screen. And we can do the same thing here for a collisions point to rectangle because we are checking for the player. We can say and ball dot is moving left because only when our ball is moving left and there is a collision, do we reverse the ball. And we can do the same thing here and ball dot is moving right. Check that our game doesn't break. And there we go. Everything works. And even though we don't see a difference, there are or rather there may be a case where an error occurs and our ball does that weird moving effect, but luckily that hasn't happened yet. In this case, had I make the paddle sizes bigger, I think I could have hit this issue, but I'm not sure. But regardless, we have this moving up, moving down, left, right, checking for collision points by a rectangle and top and bottom of our screen bound to make sure that our ball continues to move. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of cleanup for the ball class. So in this case, I do want the ability to choose the speed when the ball is created. However, our player serve determines which direction our ball is going in. And since this is the case that so in this case, because I do wish that the player chooses the speed by default, we can determine where the serve is happening, because right now, as written, this does absolutely nothing because we only rely on the player serve in the reset ball method. 
So in this case, what we can do is actually delete this because our speed, basically, whether we're greater than 400 or basically, what we can do is replace player serve equals true into speed, which will automatically equal to our vector two here. So we can just copy and paste that inside. What we can do is delete the assignment of our vector two onto the speed value. We can also go ahead and move that out down here next to our reset speed. Lastly, we can delete this because that will be determined by our speed. And what we can say is that our internal speed will equal to the speed value passed along by the player if the player so chooses to do so. On top of that, our player serve will be determined based on the speed on the x axis. So what we can say is player serve is equal to true if our speed on the x axis is greater than zero. And we'll say equal to just to catch anything that's zero and greater than. So in this case, if our speed dot x is greater than or equal to zero, that will be true. Else we just return false. And basically, this is how we get our player serve. However, again, we do not really need the player serve only until our function reset ball has been called and that player serve is passed down. And as a matter of fact, I do see one more thing. When we reset the ball, we do get the player serve. However, we do not actually update the player serve here. And so what we can do is actually add that here. So player serve is equal to whatever is passed in here as well. And right now that looks good. However, there is a third option, and that is to actually remove the player serve value because our ball doesn't actually need that. And so we can, in fact, delete all instances of the player serve because right now, as I'm seeing the code and as I'm feeling out the game, I do not think we actually need the player serve and that can be added later if needed. And that's basically it. We can also run the game and actually test out if our game is running into any issues by removing that. And that does not seem to be the case. Now, last, we do have an issue here, and that is that our speed, even though we declared it as a vector two, when the player is given a choice, the player will have the ability to choose the speed on the x-axis and the speed on the y, which is just our direction. However, in this case, we do not want to give them control over the y because when the game starts, it should be in a straight line. And so what we can do is actually change this into 400. And from here, what we do instead is we actually call a vector two. And from there, what we can do is absolute the speed on the X axis. And we can choose zero on the Y. And the reason we use absolute speed is because the player is able to give a negative number. However, if they pass in that negative number, our ball is going to the left. So in this case, negative speed goes to left. And we do not want that. And so the absolute method will turn negative values positive and keep positive values positive. From there, we can go ahead and test our game again and make sure that everything's straight. And look at that. Our ball does go in the positive x direction when the game starts. And of course, if we want to change these starting values, we can just change that there. And in this case, I'm just going to leave it as is. And that's basically it. We can continue refactoring on, for example, our variables here. We can just add booleans, integers, floats, and so forth. We can also make sure and check that we are, in fact, using underscores in each individual one as well. And I'm going to go ahead and do that all off screen because that's just a little bit of cleanup. But regardless, the most important thing is that we were able to extract out multiple items into either a function or its own individual class. Well, in this case, we went over quite a lot. In summary, refactoring is 100% subjective. The way I wrote my code is neither right or wrong. It just satisfied a requirement in this case, my personal requirement that the game state be as readable as possible. On top of that, code can always be improved. 
The more time you spend on refactoring, the more your code becomes readable, clearer. But at some point, you do have to say to yourself that you need to stop. Or in this case, I need to stop and move on by adding more features that makes the game better. And so in this case, our paddle does random values and our AI chases at a, or in this case, such a fast speed that the player will never win. And so in the future, one, we're going to add dynamic changes when the paddle collides with the ball. So that will use simple vector math. And for the AI paddle, we're going to change that as well to make sure that the player actually has a chance of winning. But regardless, refactoring takes time. And really, it's a lot of thinking, structuring, and editing. And as a matter of fact, I had to think a lot on what my code should look like as I refactored out one class into multiple classes based on my requirements. But again, those requirements can change. And if requirements change, you may need to refactor again. Now, if you are interested in what makes a good software a good software, let me be the first to tell you that there is, in fact, an international standard for quality software or for making a quality software product. Now, in this case, this comes from the International Organization for Standardization or ISO for short, and it specifically is the standard called 25010, which summarizes what a software product quality consists of. Now, in this case, I did come up with some of my standards from the maintainability section, which includes modularity, reusability, analyzability, and modifiability. I did not go over testability. That would be unit testing, for example. And this would be a great place to start. However, in my personal opinion, I think this is a little bit of overkill. Again, I'll leave links in the description down below for the ISO standard. So please feel free to take a look at that if you want to learn more about what makes a software a good software or things you may need to take into consideration when you want to make a software product a good software product. Regardless, well, that's all I have for you in this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for clicking the like button and thank you for clicking the subscribe button. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.